It's my pleasure to introduce the next segment of um, this morning's lecture. We'll be continuing where we left off, um, looking at what is consciousness and maybe more specifically, what part of our consciousness are we programming with AI. Please join me in welcoming Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paolo. Yeah. So, excuse me, I was late. I was detained here for, <laughs> I couldn't take a break. <laughs> Not even a toilet break. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so we left off with that question, right? But then, uh, I just want to, before answering the question, so what then is consciousness? Uh, I think Michael had a comment. Oh, Michael, yeah, please. Well, uh I'm sharing it because he asked yes, me. Yes, the mic. Um, Nick and I had a lovely little. Well, no, first, he mentioned about uh, Francis Crick talking about if all the molecules are changing, where resides the memory? Um, reminded me of the story. Uh, I mash up stories. So, was it George Washington? I don't know, but let's say it's him <laughs> and his little axe. And over the course of time, he changes the handle twice and the head seven times, or vice versa, it doesn't matter. Is it still his axe? Uh, that reminded me of that. But uh, Nick Nor had a nice little diagram on the board that was Newton. I cannot leave you. And, yeah. and uh, stay with me. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> Einstein, and then quantum. And then he was talking about where does consciousness reside, and it seemed to me he was finishing with uh, in the brain, but maybe beyond also. Same, the, the same diagram seemed to apply. Okay, okay. Th thank you, Michael. So uh, did, uh, did you hear what he said, right? Basically, there is a, he's, it seemed for him that there was an analogy with this drawing. So, okay, so Newtonian physics, and then uh, Einstein, right? Relativity. Quantum physics. Uh, we, we don't put a name because there was a group of them that founded quantum physics. And I'll, I'll give you a quote from the, one of the founders, Max Planck, uh, in a short while. But, uh, what Michael was saying, if I understood you right, was that you have here the human brain. It seemed possible. But I beg your pardon? It seemed possible. Yeah. And then you have here kind of layers of consciousness, right? OK. So this is, uh, in a sense, the, the field of consciousness. So the human brain is one habitation of human consciousness. It's, I mean, in, in a much larger field of consciousness. So it's a very interesting uh, observation. And there seems to be a lot of evidence pointing to that direction. And uh, I'll just show you the example, for example, of a neuroscientist who studies uh, hydrocephalus children or human beings. You know, Hydrocephalus, the brain is mostly water. It can be that 95% of your brain is water. There are no other structures aside from a thin one millimeter line of nerve cells around your skull, internal skull. So uh, the scientist forgot his name. Uh, he's been studying hydrocephalus children and he found out some of them can be very retarded but a good number of them are not. They seem to be normal, and in some instances, they're high performing. And there was one, other, one instance in his study that this guy had a first degree mathematics, uh, first, first class mathematics degree. So in other words, he couldn't do the math, and there was nothing in his brain. And uh, <laughs> there's this guy, uh, my brother just pointed this out to me just before I flew here. I, 
He, but unfortunately, he didn't, sing, uh, he didn't send the link in the email. He just mentioned it in a conversation with a group. He said, I just watched a YouTube on, and the title seems to be, uh, Does Consciousness Need a Brain? And it's a, it's a YouTube of a, a neuroscientist describing some of the anomalies in neuroscience, in the existing model of consciousness in neuroscience. And uh, one of the most startling things that he said was that, you know, he regularly does this uh, scanning, you know, this kind of scanning in the brain. He's done 80,000 of them. And so one day when he was scanning one guy, the guy had, uh, I mean, it's kind of, IQ was kind of high, it's 125, which is pretty high. The average is 100, but maybe it's higher in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy's just normal, right? So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for the history. <laughs> okay, so what happened there was that, uh, so he tried to examine this guy. The guy had no cortex, but his IQ was 125. The only, the only brain structure he had was the brain stem. This one, the primitive brain. Just to keep him functioning and so on, right? But there was no cortex. There was a skull, but there was not, nothing inside it. So he, he titled his YouTube talk, uh, Does Consciousness Need a Brain? Yeah, it's, it's just really, there are some of these anomalies that's come a, kind of more radical version of them uh, in comparison with the memory traces, which are already problematic, then you got stuff like that on top of it. So that's why, Michael, what you said about, yeah, so the current emerging models that consciousness in, in the brain, and, but the brain doesn't encompass all of it. Okay, now, uh, Delilah, would you like to share? share your experience of what you read in that book by Evan Alexander, the neuroscientist, while you were, okay, so that's the reason why I was not able to take a break. <laughs> yeah, please, no, no, go ahead, yeah, please. Yeah, you have to stand beside me. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that, the mic, okay. All right, okay. Um, so the book describes this neuroscientist. He um, goes through a severe, it's a condition, I can't remember quite the name of it, but it, affects the brain in a way that it can't properly function. And so when people go through near-death experiences, they often have things, and it's often described as a hallucination or something else that's just clicking over or part of the brain. But he described it, he said, as he was a neuroscientist, he said that his brain couldn't physically have done that because of the condition. And so what he experienced in those moments when he was or, well, it was quite a long period of time, but what he experienced couldn't have actually been something that the brain was tr triggering from inside the brain itself because the brain wasn't in a physical state to be able to do that. Um, okay. And he describes it a lot better than me, but yeah. yeah. It's pretty <laughs> but much that's pretty good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So if those who are really interested, you can take a look at the appendix. His name is, I've been asked to write names. Evan Alexander. MD. Or maybe even PhD, because he's also a neuroscientist. But he's a neurosurgeon. So he, <laughs> he cracks up people's brains. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so this model seems to be, this understanding of the brain seems to be gaining more and more currency. And therefore, we will have to take a look at, uh, you know, AI from that context. Uh, there, but the other thing is that uh, I had a fascinating conversation with Gunther on quantum physics because he's a professional physicist. And it was a really fascinating conversation. Uh, and uh, I'll incorporate that in connection with the nature of thought, which is really uh, pretty amazing. But what I just want to say uh, here is that in quantum physics, there is the, uh, uh, maybe Gunther would have the more accurate technical name, 
the observer actually determines the results of the experiment. So for example, the nature of light can either be a particle or a wave. So they thought that there was something wrong with their instruments. How can something be the opposite? Right? So how can Amsterdam be both a particle and a wave at the same time? <coughs> so that was the enigma before uh, quantum physics was established because they were trying to resolve that, that enigma. And then if you design your experiment in a certain way, then you'll get particles. If you design it in a specific way, then you'll get waves. So now they, they finally figured out that matter has those dual properties of being a particle and a wave at the same time. So that really cracked up people's <laughs> paradigm because how could that be? And it was not in the nature of the, the experimental tools, it was the nature of the matter itself. So I think, yeah? You can do it in one experiment. You hear? I mean, no, I can't do it here, but oh. <laughs> I have a list of this to do it in one experiment. Okay, yes. Yeah, you, you need, so therefore, so therefore I'm gonna, so consciousness is seeming to play a part in the results of this thing, right? And so, uh, I, I have to open again the quote from Max Planck, which is very interesting. And uh, since it's the, one of the founding fathers, together with Heisenberg and, uh, and all the other people, there are, I think three or five of them, it depends on who you're reading for the history of quantum physics. But he's definitely one of the major ones. So he says this. Okay. So this is Max Planck. I regard, I regard I mean, he's a, he's a physicist then, but then they're now coming to a different conclusion because he said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. If you, if you have that kind of understanding, then this would make sense, right? Consciousness as a, as a something much larger than matter appears within the context of consciousness. In the last day, we'll take a look at astrophysics because they're coming to the same conclusion. And it's very interesting because there you have the entire universe as the, as the basis of the foundation of that conclusion. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything we talk about and regard as existing postulates consciousness. So it's a pretty strong statement from the, mo from the founder, co-founder of the most successful scientific theory. So if he were alive today, it would be interesting to pick his brain, right? <laughs> so what is the consciousness in the smartphone? Or because it's now in using quantum theory to run the smartphone, right? So so I'm just, uh, then I'd like to turn to a little known, maybe it's not little known, it's the Global Consciousness Project in Princeton, Okay, I, yeah, people have said that I need to write down stuff. So, uh, Global Consciousness Project. By the way, it's still going on. It's been going on for quite a while. It's based in Princeton University. Princeton University in the east coast of the United States in, you know, Princeton. That's where Einstein basically resided. I mean, in terms of his, uh, the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies. But anyway, they set up a global consciousness project. Set up, incidentally, I think he, was a, he is a physicist. So they set up what they call random event generators, regs. You know, it's like the statistical noise of, you know, of uh, atoms. 
basically in their indeterminate state, whether before they turn into either a particle or a wave, that in between state. So anyway, they pick it up, they, they pick up those things. And so if you're looking at this, the charts are going to be erratic. I mean, there's no pattern. Okay, this guy had the idea that if consciousness is outside the brain, then it would pick up uh, a kind of collective consciousness if it's strong enough to actually get registered uh, in those machines. I mean, it will start affecting them into a kind of coherent pattern, change the pattern, and it's not due to chance. And so they, they started figuring out major events. And soon enough, they found out that these machines, consciousness actually affected the functioning of the machines. Okay, because, for example, what happened in 9-11 was picked up very strongly. What happened with Diana was picked up the death of Princess Diana. In other words, when there was a lot of thinking about it, it was strong enough. And there are 40 such instruments in different parts of the world. They were all picking up the same pattern. But the interesting thing with 9-11, and this kind of brings us to a diff, it's just kind of indicating a different realm that's, that is being picked up when consciousness is here. The interesting thing with this was that the 9-11 pattern was picked up a few days before it happened. Now that's, really, now, that's really interesting. And then, uh, so it, it does show that consciousness can impact matter. Now, when the size of the computer starts, the, especially the CPUs, central processing units start becoming really small. Yeah? Does it show that consciousness can affect matter or that consciousness can pick up on what is going to happen, like memory in reverse? Uh, it's both. <laughs> That's because this thing is now, neuroplasticity shows that it can. Okay, that's very clear. But it seems to be that together with quantum physics, you have access to time. You know one of the reasons why Einstein resisted quantum physics? He was resisting it for a long time, and he was the one that actually said, okay, he said, this is the thought experiment. If you can do this experimentally, then I will believe in it. Then he set up his thought experiment. Uh, I forgot the name. Maybe uh, Gunther would know the name. And it was in 1982 when they verified it experimentally, the thought experiment. So that was the, the kind of empirical ever since they, they forgot Einstein. I mean, Einstein was huge, right? But then the, fa the facts, the empirical facts, and after that experiment, several other people started doing the same thing. So basically, the, as I explained yesterday, they were picking up signals from atoms that were isolated technical, technically bil billions of miles away. They're picking up. One thing you would do here is immediately picked up here. So that is, uh, that is being picked up. Not only that is, that does it change random event generators, which are physical, what that mystery is of what consciousness is, that is the flip, the flip side of matter, basically. A portion of matter is the flip side of that. Because as you think about it, uh, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, in astrophysics, the entire physical universe is only 4%. So, so you would think that, wow, there is, it is planet Earth, there's a solar system, around the sun, and there are over 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, which is our address, and there are billions of galaxies. So you would think there's a lot of matter in space, but they're finding out there's only 4% 4 of, what? of, um, um, <laughs> of the entire universe, because 70% is dark energy, and no one understands what dark energy is, but functions like an anti-gravity force. And then the, there's dark matter. 
the remaining. So they don't exactly understand what that is, but I, I think what I'm pointing out is that this, this energy system is much larger than matter itself. And of course, that was powerfully demonstrated in Hiroshima. Yeah, Hiro, sorry for what the, what the US did to your country. But yeah, your, your famous equation, right? Energy equals speed of light, mass times speed of light squared. Einstein's proof of the interchangeability of matter and energy. So, so basically, but now there is a factor of consciousness. Maybe we could put energy here. I'm sort of jumping ahead, but I'll develop that very, very carefully in, on the fourth day. But that, yes, the Global Consciousness Project, in answer to your question, does both. Because in that, in that field of consciousness, which is not limited by matter alone, then there are bizarre things happening, like accessing the future. Now, there is an organization which has actually demonstrated this. It's called uh, Heart Math. You're familiar with it? Yeah, yeah okay. So heartmath.org. It's fascinating because they are the world's most sophisticated researcher on the heart. And their findings have actually influenced a lot of people in the world, especially mainstream education in the United States. But one of the things that they found and discovered was that the heart, maybe this is, we all know this, can know the future. So the heart, it seems, I mean, is answered that question. What kind of consciousness is that? It's not brain-based. Okay, that's the other thing. The, the consciousness is not only operative in the, in the brain, it's also operative in the heart. And then as, just as I was flying here, I was tempted to buy a book, which is called The, the Gut. Yeah. <laughs> because now that's the biggest destroyer of the paradigm in medicine because they're showing a very, there's a gut brain here, <laughs> and it's affecting all kinds of things in the, in the brain. And they showed that in the embryology, well, anyway, there's a whole other story, but they've now found three centers, which for those of you who are familiar, are very interesting, right? The center, the gut brain, the heart brain, up oh, the heart brain, the gut brain, and the brain. <laughs> <laughs> so three centers with three different functions, and I'm sure you can fill in the dots for those who are familiar with the, with the correlation of the three kinds of consciousness with the body. For those basically thinking, feeling, and willing, right? So I, I was tempted because there was a medical doctor that gave a presentation a few days before I went for Australia, and I saw the book, The Gut, and I read it. It was exactly that, uh, the fast-changing field of uh, consciousness in the gut. So everything's not in the brain. It's already giving a kind of indication that different kinds of intelligences in the human being itself. So if intelligence is not just cognitive, we're dealing with, and these non-cognitive consciousness states have different, basically have different bodily anchors. So what is it that we're doing in AI, right? That is, the, that is the question. So they, they found out that the heart, I mean, your, your question is triggering a lot of things. Sorry. Luis, it's okay. <laughs> it's important. It's, uh, the heart, apparently, from scientific research, is access to the future. In other words, it's able to intuit an event before it happens. And I used myself not to believe that until my father told me the story. My father is a civil engineer. He was in charge of all the dam construction in the Philippines and the water system. And he was such a perfectionist. That, but my mother was uh, kind of intuitive. And my father would get upset 
We may mother and say, oops, are you sure that calculation is correct? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then one day it happened that, so there was this dam that's now the source of water for Metro Manila. It's a huge dam, and my father was in charge of it, the design, the, you know, everything. And he was doing this calculation. Yeah, he was educated actually at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which at that time was already a top uh, technology institute. So he's very, he was very qualified to do that work. And he figured out, usually when he does a civil engineering project, maybe there'll be a half a cement in excess. So it's very precise. So he did all these calculations to the dam. <laughs> And then one day my mother said, you know, I think the dam will collapse. <laughs> That's what my mother said, right? Very encouraging. Yeah, very encouraging. So I said, oh, no, there you go again, right? That's the usual thing. So, I mean, then he cross-checked his calculations and he found out there was, there was, there was actually a gap and it, the dam would actually have collapsed. So the question is, how did my mother, who had zero access to civil engineering, get to know that his equations and how he was calculating was accurate. So, so anyway, now the scientific basis for that is here. They show that the heart brain, which is as, almost as complex as the neural brain. Uh, in fact, they also found out one thing about the heart brain, which functions differently from the neural brain, that it has more influence on the neural brain than the neural brain on the heart. It's a one big uh, nerve uh, uh, vessel that goes to the brain directly from the heart and it's not circulated back to the heart. So <laughs> it's saying that the heart is primary organ. And in fact, in embryology, that's exactly what they're finding out. Because the first organ that develops in the embryo of, of, the, of the womb it's the heart, not the brain. The heart comes there, and then a few days later, the brain appears. The human being is uh, quite complex and mysterious in many ways. And the question is, are we capturing this in the AI? Is the, is the fundamental question. What would it mean if you're able to really design an AI that is in a sense, has all this stuff, right? Or can it ever be done? Or does consciousness operate beyond simple digital logic? Which all these other things are seem to be showing. Now, uh, so what happens if you're out there? Okay, so what happens if you're not here anymore and you're out there? And this, uh, so I'm going to quote from Evan Alexander's book, uh, uh, the neuroscientist who had a near-death experience, and then try to relate this to intuitive thinking and the uh, world championship against an AI and go, right? I think there's a connection, okay? and then begin to sense what we're kind of dealing with. Okay, this is Evan Alexander's quote, and then you can check it, Delilah, if I'm, if, if I'm pulling a leg or not. <laughs> okay, to experience thinking outside the brain, because that's what happened to him. To experience thinking outside the brain, which is by scientific standards impossible, because thinking is in the brain. But he's saying, my experience was that I was thinking outside my brain. And to experience thinking outside the brain is to enter a world of instantaneous connections. Now, this is very interesting because that's exactly the description of scientific studies on creativity. The sudden flash of insight that you get. And then all of a sudden, you're able to connect all kinds of stuff that you were not able to connect before. And sometimes when you download this after that experience, which by the way is outside the brain, it's not inside the brain. So intuition, 
creative intuition. Then, you know, by the way, if the Go champion defeated the AI, where did he get his intuition? So surely, not by the mere calculation, right? In, in intuition, you're having access to these kinds of connections, uh, which, by the way, is also the conclusion uh, in epistemology, philosophy of knowledge, or science of knowledge. I'll, I'll, I'll go into that later on. So to experience thinking outside the brain is to enter a world of instantaneous connection. But in modern physics language, this instant connection is nothing but non-locality. So you're entering a world, a world of non-local. Everything is instantaneously connected beyond space and time, no loss of energy. It's a very different kind of consciousness. Okay, and this is something that is very interesting. And then it says, that make ordinary thinking. So now he's distinguishing between the thinking. Can you repeat, the, that? Can you repeat that bit? That make ordinary thinking. So he's distinguishing between two kinds of thinking. Okay, the thinking that is outside the brain, which is the creative thinking, intuitive. But this one is even more full-blown. And the ordinary thinking that we experience in the brain which are, by the way, mostly memory. That's why we can get, really get stuck in the past if we're just in ordinary thinking. And that's why we have to go <laughs> around. So he says, those, this, those aspects limited, ordinary thinking are those aspects limited by the physical brain. And then he mentions here something really interesting, and the speed of light. And the speed of light. So basically, that, the speed of light is the constant in the physical universe. Einstein kept on insisting nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But then with non-local in quantum physics, that whole thing was basically overturned. So he's really speaking here of a non-local. What's that? Oh. Where? It was, it's rubbed out. Yeah. Non local. So non local non local reality empirical phenomena has been demonstrated in quantum physics. But if we really experience this inst instantaneity of existence in our consciousness, which this guy is describing, then we're really his description here is very interesting because it's very similar to the studies in creative thinking. Why do people all of a sudden get flashes of insight that they are able to connect everything? But here it's prolonged because it's really outside his body. So that make ordinary thinking the world of instantaneous connections that make ordinary thinking those aspects limited by the physical brain, the speed of light, seem like hopelessly sleepy and plodding event. So the speed of light is too slow. So, I mean, this is very interesting because when we have an intuition, we're, we're using a different kind of thinking. And, I mean, this is converging with actually what they're doing in terms of philosophy of knowledge, but I'm sure all of you who are able to reflect upon your creative experience would see that this is not definitely ordinary experience, ordinary thinking. I think this is in the realm of experience. They're just trying to formalize it here in, in certain different words. And therefore, I'd just like to, with that kind of segue, take a look at how knowledge is produced in human consciousness, because that's what's being imitated. Okay. I can erase this already. Yeah, okay. This too, yeah.
Yeah, Matthew. Um, I, this idea of something being faster than the speed of light, um, isn't that assuming that um, consciousness needs to go somewhere? <laughs> yes, it doesn't need to go somewhere. But, I mean, or, or it's in a... Specific location? Specific part, yeah. Yeah, very good. Because if it's just yeah. everywhere, it doesn't need to go anywhere. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct, Matthew, because that is the current understanding that's emerging. That consciousness, our, con our own consciousness is very vast, but we're training to be in a physical body. Yeah. Just to emphasize what you were saying, what you were saying is that in physics, if you can distinguish between two things, the one is what you described as the quantum Fourier. Yeah. And that's actually that's simultaneous. There's no time in between. And that's what you meant with the global consciousness. Right. Doesn't, which is instantaneous there. Right. The other one, if you need to transfer some information, that is more the type of thinking when you say we develop from what we have here and just roll it on and on and on and get somewhere. Yeah. That is the information transfer and then yeah. light. Nothing goes faster than speed of light. And I mean the quantum thing you were mentioning is not in contradiction with that in physics. Exactly. But these are two completely different type of things. <coughs> the one instantaneous is there. Right. These two things which are far away and they are related to each other. The other one is the information transfer, which needs time. Right. And this is our slow thinking, so to say. Yeah. Or, no, no, this is, this is it's a related to that. So it's kind of an image to one and the other one. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gunther, for that very important comment. Now I have to repeat it. <laughs> 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 I've been requested to repeat comments from the audience. Uh, so first, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew, right? Matthew's comment that does consciousness need to be anywhere from one point to another for it to travel? He said, why can't it just be there? But in fact, that is what happens when you're, when you're, when you're conscious outside your brain. Okay, and then Gunther uh, is saying that there are two aspects of, uh, <laughs> okay, this is the more difficult one. <laughs> okay, there is the, pheno I'll just call it the phenomena and the quantum phenomena where things are simultaneous. It's instantly things there are all connected and which I am equating to the intuitive experience. That's how you get a sense of uh, the whole. And then the other things that requires information transfer that is taking place, among others, in the physical brain, and the limit of which is physical light, the speed of light. Is that correct, Gunther? OK, good. OK, <laughs> I just want to, that's a very valuable piece of uh, distinction. So uh, in a sense, yeah, in a sense, consciousness is starting to affirm that the human being, I mean, consciousness studies. By the way, there, in the United States, there are 5,000 courses on consciousness studies. It's, be, it's exploding. I mean, real, real heavy-duty kinds of, uh, there's PhD you know, degrees in that whole field. And by the way, in those kinds of studies, they call this model, which they don't draw it like this, but I drew it like this. They call it, you transcend and include, okay? So you're not excluding, because reality is one. There's a reality in Newtonian physics, but there are other realities that cannot be encompassed in Newtonian physics, but then you include it. So Einstein came and included that and started talking about the nature of the physical universe in another way. And then quantum physics came in and did the same for both. So transcend and include. That's why Michael's comment really struck me, because it's transcending and including. Those two types of thinking have different functions, but we have 
basically intuitive thinking and ordinary thinking. The ordinary thinking is the one that is programmed. Okay, so it looks like this. Uh, uh, from, the, from the epistemological point of view, you have the given. Okay, some will call that experience. And some of you who are into Steiner's work will be very familiar with this because in a sense, this is the, the philosophy of freedom, right? Okay. How, is, how, how can humans... He was dealing with that because he was living in the age of the height of the thinking that consciousness was in the brain. And he was trying to study this knowledge. So you have an experience, but that experience would not mean anything unless you think about it, right? So there's the thinking process. And out of that, a certain kind of knowledge is produced. Yeah? So you have any given, but you will have to think about it to make sense of it. Okay? For any experience. So if you're feeling something and you just let it go, what, what does it mean? When you say meaning, you're actually searching for its connection in terms of a larger picture, right? So the thinking gives us knowledge. Now, this knowledge can then be subject to another reflection, to another thinking process, right? And you have, I'll call this knowledge one, and you have knowledge two, right? Yeah? So what, in effect, did this once living experience, what, in effect, did it do? It became the new given, right? The new experience. Okay, so we have an experience, a given, anything that enters our perception, both outside and inside. We think about it. We have a certain understanding that grows out of it, but that understanding itself can now be subject, becomes the new given, and then this is how basically sciences are built up. Okay, in a systematic way. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the thinking, cognitive procedure. But of course, you have all kinds of rules, like uh, what's the hypothesis, what are the variables, all of that. You, you add that into your thinking process so you get reliable results. Uh, science is ultimately about what results are reliable. Yeah, because in the end, nothing can be permanent, even the results of spiritual science. So, you have that, 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 that is the ultimate goal because science developed in history as a reaction to all the speculations of the scholastics in the Middle Ages where there was a lot of thinking, speculation, but then there was nothing empirical. And so Newton, oh no, Bacon came. <laughs> totally overhauled. And that's why science today has an inductive character. Okay, so this is very important because this is the kind of thinking that's active in AI, inductive. And the, and the algorithms are the kind of... Can you explain inductive? Ah, uh, yeah. There are two kinds of thinking, inductive and deductive. Okay, so inductive... Inductive thinking is, you know, you have parts, and then you try to link out how those parts are connected, right? That is basically the reductionist approach. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's one approach to knowledge, except that 
if a system is not is working as a system as a whole, this will not capture it, right? So that's inductive from the parts to the whole. Yeah, deductive. is from the whole to the parts. So you have a kind, it's very interesting, most scientists, of, a study of scientists, okay, a science of science, which is a special field in sociology, they take a look at how scientists think. Most of them are deductive, although the tenet is inductive approach. And then what they do, like Newton, Newton was deductive. And then what he did was then he started placing what he experienced in mathematical language. So there might be an intuition of what reality is, but then you have now to show the mathematics of it because mathematics is the foundation of all sciences and nothing is hard science unless there's mathematics. <laughs> and the reason I'm looking at Gunther because <laughs> There was a mathematics envy of the physicist and the chemist envy of the physicist and the psychologist envy of the, you know what I'm saying? Everybody was going down to the mathematics side. Newton wasn't able to come up with his laws in an inductive way. It's impossible. You can see that very easily. Yeah. He had an inductive approach. Right. And we, but we, we, we claim it is inductive. Inductive, right. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because I was going to talk about Jung's psychology in this context. But what Gunther was saying is that basically many scientists are trying to work on the inductive, but many of their major insights are deductive. These are the moments of real inspiration. They finally understand it and they work out. Uh, there was a very interesting example in mathematics. My brother told me about it. He's a PhD in mathematics, basically statistics. He said that there was this very interesting thing that he that he's either saw in the YouTube or read an article about. There was a mathematician <laughs> who was writing in the blackboard all these equations. And then 45 minutes into it, people did not understand where he was going. And they were just kind of murmuring, what, what, what is the relevance? And then he's now over an R, and he's writing those equations. And they said, those were murmurs, because then they can begin to see. And then after one and a half hours, they gave him a standing ovation. <laughs> OK, that's really geeky, right? We don't, <laughs> unless you're a mathematician, you will not understand that. But, but the point is that many of these mathematical theories are often moments of intuition. They start with an intuition and they start to work out the mathematics of the whole thing if that intuition was correct. No, I, ju I just wanted to, to bring that in because, okay, thank you. Oh yeah, please. Simultaneous thinking? Yeah, you are usually the, okay, I'm, I'm referring now to studies of uh, scientific intuition. Usually it starts deductive, it goes inductive and then goes back deductive and it's not really simultaneous. Yeah, it's like sometimes it can go back, uh, for, back and forth very fast. But that will be something else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now, okay, here's the interesting thing, okay? Obviously, the thinking in us is making sense of something, right? The experiences. In this case, uh, we can short, shortcut this and say, what is the relationship between thinking and thought? Because this is now a thought, right? Yeah, knowledge is a thought. So what is now the relationship between thinking and thought? Thought is in the past, 
Yeah. Yeah, so thinking is the process. Thought is the result. Just like here, you have an experience. And that's how science builds itself up, right? So the interesting thing there is that, so how does it work when you program a computer? In, in, in that kind of understanding. So if you work this thing out here, the given in the computer is basically big data, right? Data. That's why all the AI programs have to be, if they want to learn, let's say, anything, they'll be given a whole set of data relevant to that learning field, right? So. You have the data input. Uh, in the case of Watson, the entire different sets of Wikipedia and all of that. Okay, so that's data. And then what is the substitute for thinking? What? Yeah, algorithm. Yeah. So the algorithm. is the substitute for thinking. But if you look at it from this perspective, the algorithm is already dead. It's finished thought. Here, yeah? Because what happens is that the AI programmers had this insight. How do we create learning systems, right? How do we simulate neural nets? All of that, okay. They have a given experience in their field. Then they have to think about it creatively. And then they get an insight. And they produce a new algorithm, which is very powerful, just like the AI that defeated the GOAT champion. But the algorithm is a kind of finished thought. And in the language of Godel, Godel all the different Aspects of it are connected to the, to the assumptions of that algorithm. It cannot calculate beyond that. And so if they want to do something else, they have to change the algorithm. That's why I was talking about the hybrid. There's a hybrid human artificial intelligence that's going on because this is becoming more and more powerful with AI, but the, the progress of AI is connected to intuition that has this instantaneous. So the interesting thing with that game was that at some point, that instantaneous thing, I'm trying to figure out, okay, this, I, <laughs> this is my hypothesis of that world championship, right? So the human side had actual intuition, right? Because how can you play that game against a super intelligence? I'm not super intelligence, but a very intelligent, artificial intelligent uh, machine. And you cannot access all the future moves. You're just moving in a certain area, right? So he, he, he will basically be wiped out if he had no living intuition, basically creative thinking from the very beginning. He's wiped out in a few seconds. The fact that he can last there for hours <laughs> shows that this, this, this thing is a certain thing going on, right? But then the computer, which is very interesting, and we have to remember uh, any game has a set of rules beyond which you cannot get out of. So this, this AI is very powerful, but it's constrained by those rules. It cannot go outside the instructions. But within it, it's very powerful because it can figure out what you, human beings have not figured out within those set of instructions because the possible number of games is almost infinite. That's why it seems like a new thing, which in a sense it is new, but it's still 
limited unless something new. That's why, for me, whether or not AI becomes super intelligent is one question, but this is becoming more and more powerful. So this stuck in the quantitative. Yes, yeah, stuck in the quantitative, mm -hmm. but becoming more powerful because the human mind has limited access to all the data of the world. Well, the computer technically will not have that. It will have access to anything that's encoded. Because in 2011, they can already read natural language. And that's why the computer that defeated the, jo the world Jeopardy, Jeopardy, Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> champions, uh, the computer read everything in, tr in three seconds. The data, the human being <laughs> will take he years to read the entire encyclopedia, right? Just yes, no. Yeah, exactly. Please? So literally saying that AI has access to all the information out there that we can't as ordinary human beings, but it's still limited by that. Yeah. That's a constraint still. Even though it's infinite, it involves so much information, but that's still a constraint that it's within currently? Yeah, currently. But there's a possibility. Now, so the real AI for me, <laughs> this is the scary AI part. If it goes to this level, then that will make things really interesting. It's beyond control. Who, who among here can control anybody here, right? None. <laughs> what? Basically, the fundamental experience of freedom. Yeah, this is where freedom is coming from. Steph? Um, maybe don't answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> or, or do. Um, up to you. How are we so sure that our thinking process from the top yeah. is not just a broader... You said that the algorithm is limited to rules. Yes. Sure that our thinking process is not also an algorithm limited to rules, but it's so broad that we can't see the rules. But right. you build an algorithm that's similarly broad, and right. what we call intuition, right. just things that inside the rules that we don't understand. Right. Yeah, to a certain extent, uh, that's exactly it. But the people use that to say, you know, the entire laws of the universe, which we're still discovering, is a form of a law which in a sense sets certain limits, but in effect, none. The so, limits. Yeah, the unlimited yeah. limits. So therefore, because one of the questions, for example, that really um, inspired Einstein and many philosophers of science, they're saying, why does the universe even have laws? Even have laws? Because from that perspective, you're asking Steph, is that so our consciousness is the thinking itself is doing the connection, the instantaneous connection is doing it within a given field of experience. But it's doing it. It's, yeah, it's doing, it's doing it's the, it. Yeah, it's doing the connection. But it's doing it without Yeah, with the given. Right. So if you, yeah, if you want to call that a, a kind of uh, constraint to human, yeah, that's, uh, in effect, it's not a constraint because the universe itself is evolving. That's what makes the whole thing complicated. The current evolutionary process is still evolving. Facets of the universe are still evolving. In fact, there is now some arguments within the scientific community that physical laws are also evolving. So it's making things complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So generate was one of the words, and infinite diversity. 
right? And with the fractals. Yeah, the fractals, Mandelbrot, so and his fractal. How yeah. does that fit into this? Is that, that still an algorithm with that limitation? Yeah, uh, ultimately it's going to be a very powerful algorithm, right? Sorry. Because, see, what's happening is that the same thing that's happening in, in physics is happening in mathematics. It's also evolving in a similar fashion. So what, what is the theory of everything that they're searching in mathematics? It's the entire interconnection of all the forces that are known to govern physical existence. So when they get that, that is a very large theory that would link gravity, electromagnetic waves, weak electron, fo I mean, like fro electron force, right, and, and so on, right? So that would be something like this, but in the end, we can, no one can say that that's the limit because the universe is still unfolding. So basically, there's no limit to knowledge. So we're all Kantian in the end. Uh, no. All what? All what? Kantian. Kant. No, we're not Kant. The philosopher Kant, Immanuel Kant. 18th century, he basically started the science of knowledge. He summed up all the key questions of knowledge in the past and wrote this book, A Critique of Pure Reason. But no, this is very different from Kantian because what Kant did was that, okay, if you take this process, the knowledge is actually retained as memory in our consciousness and it becomes a mental picture. Or in technical philosophical language, representations. So what happens there is that for Kant, you are not seeing the thing in itself because your consciousness is full of mental representations you never know the thing in itself. I mean, it's a very simplistic thing. But this one's different, it's, a, it's saying, ultimately, you just advance further and further into real knowledge, but because reality itself is infinite, then, uh, that's two different things, because here is, you end up with illusion, whereas there you're advancing uh, in very different ways. So strictly speaking, an algorithm is a kind of mental picture. So is thought. But it's very sophisticated. And it's doing all kinds of things in the world, concrete things, as a product of human thought. But is heart thinking algorithmic? Is heart thinking algorithmic? No. Yeah? yeah? I was going to say, our observation is lots of, if not the majority of the scientific explorations, are using a certain paradigm to explore a different paradigm. Ex it's like being in this room <laughs> and wanting God. to explore the tree through the door, through the windows right. and the door, or even right. through the wall. Right. And where you talked about uh, knowledge, but there's also the, the thinking, there's also the language. Mm -hmm. So language creating a reality. Right. And already being limited in the language because right. we see in this room here yeah. trying to understand the tree. Right. It's squeaked, like there's yeah. noise, white noise coming in. <laughs> right. Before yeah. we're getting to the point of observation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, study. Yeah, that was where the whole linguistic philosophers came in with that comment. But they forgot. And that's why linguistic philosophy also declined. Yeah. They forgot that there is this kind of autonomous consciousness that can actually say that, what you're saying. Because if you had no awareness of what you're saying, there's no way to correct it. Yes. But if you realize that's what language is doing, then you can find ways now to, to use that fact and carry on. That's why language, thought, and reality, Benjamin Lee Wolf, right? Classic in that kind of thinking. Language, thought, and reality is basically the elaborate expression of this worldview.
Benjamin Lee Worth. I forgot his family. Lee Worth. I cannot. Worth. W H R. Yeah, it's like, right. W H R. Uh, no, I think it's like this. Yeah. yeah. Right, you're correct. Yeah, when I see it, then. Yeah, but that's why linguistics are now saying, okay, we all learn a certain language when we're young, when we develop this autonomous thinking process within using the language. First, we see the world through a language, but now this gives us the kind of autonomy to see that that kind of language that we're seeing through was actually limiting our reality. But we have to understand that each language educates the human being in a very specific way. This is very important. I mean, not as a disclaimer, I mean, the refutation of this, but saying, for example, Filipino language versus German or versus English. Filipino language, we have over 100 words for touch. Touch. So it is clear that our language is training our consciousness in terms of the different nuances connected with touch. Yeah, yeah, it's more touchy-feely. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> as they would say in the West Coast, right? Yeah, and then the German language is totally different. But uh, our culture teaches us all the nuances of touch. So in terms of the perception of touch, it's very deep. So the question is, if your language gives you a certain experience of touch, so this is very interesting because there are all kinds of uh, part of the AI revolutions connected to perception. So what aspects of your perception are being limited? Because exactly we know, I mean, at least in our language, the deeper levels of touch. I mean, I, I, I grew up with it, so I, I got educated to perceive that. Yeah, I was one time in the US and certain things were happening there in the room. And then I made an intervention. And then the, the American asked me, my American friend said, how did you see that? I mean, it was so obvious for me, but <laughs> their culture taught them to say, nothing exists unless you say it. I mean, that part of American culture. So they could not perceive unless somebody verbalizes. In our culture, we can see what's going on even if it's not verbalized. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking then, so we, um, so in, in relation to the knowledges, our brain knowledge, our heart knowledge, our gut knowledge, yeah. we want to learn the language. And to exactly. Be able they, to read. Yeah. They speak different languages. I've worked with indigenous communities. Okay. Um, one conversation I had with a, a, an elder there, a friend of mine, when we were talking about connection right. and listening, yes. um, she said to me, we listen here. Mm, interesting, huh? Yeah. Right. And, and so the sort of practice of trying to read this yeah. inner, um, this inner knowledge. Is yeah, it's very interesting. The Greeks spoke about consciousness coming from their organs. Uh -huh. And we said it's kind of superstitious, right? But now we're finding out there's different, or these different organs have specific uh, kinds of uh, knowledge that is blocked out from the brain. So I see the time is, is up. And unless there are any kind of uh, burning questions, then we can call it a morning. Yeah, thank you.